So great to be here. I'm going to go through these issues, which a lot of you may already be familiar with, but we're going to do so in an advanced way. This information is also on our website at A Well-Fed World, and that's at awfw.org, so our initials awfw.org. And you can also reach me at dawn at awfw.org if you'd like to follow up. You'll see here the connections. We already know the ways in which meat hurt animals, not just farmed animals, but also wildlife and ecosystems. I'm going to briefly talk about the connections with global hunger, again, at a more advanced level. And then we also know that meat impacts climate. So we'll address that. And then also climate, of course, impacts hunger. And this is increasingly the case. And then climate also impacts animals, which is why we see climate on topic here so much more and at animal conferences so much more because we can't save animals without addressing climate issues. Even if we were to get rid of human exploitation at this point, the damage and harm done by climate is going to far outweigh that. So we need to address both, and they're related. So briefly what I'm gonna do, again, is uh, meat increases hunger, and I'm gonna talk about the tangible, the real life impacts of that, not just theoretical. Also the ways in which climate change increases hunger, and so that's not just decreased yields, but also climate disasters. And then the greenhouse gases, of course, with climate change, and then the increasing meat trends. So if you've seen my talk before, um, a lot of that trend is still on trend, uh, but then I'm also gonna bring in the cultured meat aspect because that is uh, increasingly a topic. And last year we were here and I didn't address it and somebody else addressed cultured meat and so it was confusing. So I'm gonna bring that in to the context. And part of the, the issue is numbers. And so that is a theme that is overarching with my talk. And I'll keep coming back to the issue of numbers, understanding numbers, and what that matters, uh, what it means for us as activists. Crop intensive. So plainly speaking, animals eat much more food than they produce. We know this. This is not just calories. It's not just trading up to protein. It's also protein, nutrients. Animals just in, eat much more than they produce. So the, the advanced version of this, though, is understanding the numbers. So when the industry talks about the feed conversion ratios, how much more animals eat than what they produce, they use live weight numbers. And this is what you'll see as the standard. It's very conservative. These numbers are much too low. But if we don't know the ways in which they're low, we don't know how to address that issue. And when our numbers are greater, because in the vegetarian vegan communities, a lot of times we'll see bigger numbers, like 16 to 1 has been very popular for cows. But actually, they'll say 7 or 10 to 1 in, in the papers from the UN or other think tanks or the industry papers. But we're actually going to talk about the ways in which it's 25, 25 to one. So not 16, not seven. And for chickens, poultry is, is very um, celebrated within the industry as being efficient at two to one. Uh, we're going to talk about that that's four and a half or five, even more. And so the reason is, is the, that it's edible weight. So the live weight is how much they have to eat to produce a pound of weight, but they're still alive. That is before they take away the blood and the bones. You don't need to know the butcher weight, but it's this edible weight. How much meat, how much is actually left that's gonna be consumed after all of that? And that's where we get the much greater inefficiencies with meat. So it's even worse than people think and what they say. So this is kind of the special knowledge, because I know most of us already know about animals being inefficient converters of food, but this is the edible weight, and it's important for research. And these are numbers from Vlachov Smeal, so he's a researcher. It's not just uh, us looking to increase the numbers. Uh, there's a lot of backup, and there's, it's actually even worse if we wanted to include grass and hay and things of that nature, which have ecological impacts. So just very basic, we're dealing with food versus feed. And the ways in which meat increases demand for crops, and this puts upward pressure on prices. And then that's what pulls food away from the world's poor because they can't afford it. So they're basically being outbid for feed. And I think we understand this, but I just want to make it simple for those of us who haven't been uh, familiar with the hunger issues as much or maybe on video. 
that the ways in which meat tangibly, it's not just that we don't eat meat and then there's extra food for people who are hungry and it's immediately there. That's not how it works. But there is a supply and demand pressure that happens and there's also other impacts in terms of foreign exchange and politics, geopolitical politics. It's not exact, but this is just, again, a trend in which um, why it matters. And so just briefly for supply and demand, I'm going to pretend that I had a bunch of apples, but there was this rich pig farmer who decided that he wanted the apples for his pigs so that he could make pork. And before I got here, he bought up a bunch of my apples for a really good price, and now I only have a few left. I have five apples left. And we'll say you haven't had breakfast and you're quite hungry. And I have five apples, but there's many more of you than five. So why, maybe I would sell these for a euro normally, but say I could probably get two euros, maybe three, maybe four. This is the way in which when demand is high relative to supply, the price can go up. So just trying to make a, a simple example of it. But when supply is greater than demand or relatively high, so sup suppose that pig farmer decided to sell soy. So now I have all these extra apples. Now I'm not going to be able to get two, three, five euros for these apples because there's so many. If I want to get rid of them, maybe they come back down to a euro. And then you all are like, yeah, for a euro I want an apple. Not for five, but for one, yes. Or maybe that's all you can afford. So this is how having increased supply can put downward pressure. And it helps hunger, especially for those who are income dependent. So when you're talking rural communities, it's offset. And if they're selling food, there's an offset because that might lower their prices. So again, it's, it's not comprehensive, but it is somewhere to just understand the ways in which pressure works. And I gave this specifically its own slide, no graphics, just to be really clear that even if we have all the food, we still don't just have no hunger. Vegan does not solve hunger. And I know some people might say a vegan world would solve world hunger because we would have compassion. So that's different. But just vegan diets and having all the food supply available is not just going to be a panacea. It's not going to solve world hunger. So if you're speaking about these issues, uh, please don't frame it that way because it also makes us look naive and we want to be sophisticated in the ways in which we talk about this. But again, it is real. And it's real to the, uh, to the degree that if we talk about biofuels and food waste, so people understand and care about biofuels and food waste. We can use this to our advantage because if people try to debate us about the crop use, then they might not understand, they might be defensive, they're trying to work around it, but they understand biofuels and food waste. Biofuels, to the extent, I, I think food waste is the bigger issue, but biofuels is so important that the UN repertoire to the right of food called biofuels a crime against humanity in terms of its impact on global hunger. A crime against humanity, that's, that's big. He's been fighting against it, and the, what it is is the diversion of food for fuel. But if we look at the graph, it's actually a very small percentage of edible crops are being used for biofuels. This graph shows 5%. I've also seen 6%. But it's still a very small slice of global edible crops are going for biofuels. Much more, about a third of the world's crops are going for livestock feed, to feed farmed animals. And so if we really were concerned about this diversion of crops, we could easily just reduce our consumption of animal source foods and free up the crops there and then still have biofuels. It's also much worse than food waste. We don't have to have the exact numbers on this, but we just have to know people are concerned about food waste. It's a very big issue. Nobody argues that we should waste more food. But if you care about food waste, then you care about the food that's being wasted by cycling it through animals. And I, again, I know we all know this, but if this is just something to give you as a tool so that if you're talking to other people who don't get the issues, make it about food waste. So when we talked about those feed uh, conversion ratios on the other one, and we talked about the industry saying that, that poultry, chickens, turkeys, that they're efficient. They celebrate the efficiency of chickens and turkeys. 
for only consuming two to one ratios, meaning they consume twice as much food as they produce. Twice as much food, but that's a waste. We're wasting a third of the food um, in crops, and that's a big crime. But if we are celebrating by wasting even more of that through chicken, and then, of course, the pigs and cows are eating many more crops than that. So if you care about food waste, then you care about the overconsumption of, of uh, crops for animal source foods. This is a, an example, so we can use this example either with the lower numbers that the industry likes to use at seven or 10, um, but if we are also looking at the, the conversion ratios of edible weight, once it gets down to a burger patty, we're looking at 25 to one. And again, the numbers, just to make this example very clear, if we have a 100 calorie burger patty that uses 2,500 global calories, so that's an unfair share of global resources that meat eaters of the world are taking from the global community. It's an unfair share. That's enough food for a day. That's enough calories for the day. It's a form of redistribution. It's a form of waste. So these are just some takeaway points. I'm trying to, I'm covering a lot of material. So I want to break it down at the beginning and end of each section and, and make it clear. We already know animals eat much more food than that we produce. Again, this is a more advanced audience, so I, I still have these slides, but that's, that's the staple point usually, um, and then staple crops. So it increases the prices we just went over so that people who can't afford um, the, even the basic foods get priced out, and then meat as a form of overconsumption, redistribution, and waste, and that's waste of food, water, and energy. Another one, climate change increases hunger. I'm not going to spend much time on this. It's very uh, easy just to kind of understand. This map shows the intensity. The darker numbers show more hunger. This is where it's concentrated. These orange and yellow areas are still very intense. And you'll see the US, for example, North America, uh, US and Canada, there's still a lot in Mexico. But there's, there, it's not showing any color. We still have hunger. There's hunger everywhere. So this is an intensity of hunger. Most of the hunger uh, is located in Africa per capita, but then in total numbers, so per capita is per person, in total numbers it's gonna be in Asia because there's a much greater population. So this is the hunger concentration, and then this is where the impact on, on crop yields is expected. So this is where there's gonna be more difficulty growing different types of crops. And you can see that Africa is very impacted, Asia is very impacted, India. India gets hit every year every year with just these horrible tsunamis and storms. And even the US is gonna get hit and some other countries, but it's, we have more resilience. So the, these areas that are already impoverished and don't have resilience are get, getting hit even harder. And you've heard earlier um, in this conference and probably before that these are the countries who have contributed the least to greenhouse gases and are getting hit the worst. So anyone along the equator and along the coastal areas are getting hit the worst. So that's the ways in which it increases hunger. Crop yields and then also increasing and increasingly frequent and increasingly intense climate uh, natural disasters. And then meat increases climate change. So there's so many ways in which uh, using animals for food contributes to climate change. I'm just gonna hit on a few brief points. We already discussed crops, so any energy climate issues related to crops get magnified intensely by uh, the inefficiencies that we just discussed. And now I'm also gonna talk about methane and grazing. So here's the, the key point that a lot of folks don't know about, so is the grass fed. Grazing is often put out there as the more eco-friendly way of, of raising cattle, but it's not. It's more climate unfriendly by a great deal. And the reason is that ruminant animals, cows, sheep, lambs, when they are eating goats, the, the food, when they're eating grass and their natural diet, it produces more methane than when they are fed cereals. So when they're factory farmed, and eating cereals that we bring to them in grains, it's different than when they're eating grass and their natural foods. They produce three times as much methane. And methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas. It's 84 times more potent of a greenhouse gas over a 20 year time period. 
And if you've heard the numbers that it's 20 to 25 times more potent of a greenhouse gas, which is tremendous, that's over a 100 year time period. So again, coming back to the idea of numbers and understanding the numbers and what they mean, almost any numbers you see in traditional research are gonna be conservative. That's over a 100 year time frame. We don't have 100 years. Over a 20 year time frame, methane is 84 times more powerful of a greenhouse gas. Over five years, it's 100 times more powerful of a greenhouse gas. And it also has a much shorter half-life. So this is the good news. If we reduce consumption, if we stop having so many farmed animals on the earth to produce meat, that's gonna pull out the methane and that's gonna have a much quicker uh, impact on greenhouse gases than say carbon dioxide, which stays in the, the air much longer. This is also an important issue for cheese. So if you're trying to get folks to understand the difference between vegetarianism and veganism, and they care about the climate, which hopefully everybody does now, cheese is actually the number three greenhouse gas emitting intense food. And the reason is because it's dairy. So it's coming from cows, a lot of whom are grass fed, even if they're feedlot finished. And then cheese is a, an intense form of dairy. So it's very concentrated dairy. And so that's what makes cheese such a climate unfriendly food. And that can help us um, persuade folks who are still um, holding on to it. And this is kind of one of the last points I wanna make in terms of grazing, uh, also feed crops, is the deforestation. Deforestation not only produces the, the carbon that's being released, but it also takes away our photosynthetic uh, capabilities. So the photosynthesis from the trees, which pulls carbon out of the air, we're losing that for every tree we cut down. What we need to be doing is reforesting. If we're reducing our livestock um, production and consumption, then we're able to use that land, we could reforest it. We might use it for other things, but what we need to be doing is reforesting instead of deforesting, but we're still deforesting at massive degrees, and uh, so we're losing photosynthesis as well as uh, the other components of deforestation. And so that also helps with the grazing. So that, again, that's feed crops and grazing, but most of the deforestation right now is happening for grazing. So people who wanna think that it's eco-friendly, it's not. The carbon sequestration that happens is nothing compared to the methane that's being emitted or the photosynthesis that we're losing. I added this slide for the Amazon fires. Uh, a lot of us are, are hope broken um, recently over what's going on, what's still going on right now with the Amazon on fire. Uh, I knew a little bit, but I didn't know the numbers to this degree. I was shocked to find out that this is common practice. This isn't just some fluke that happened or just something with the, the right-wing government that's happened. This is actually tens of thousands of fires are, are used annually to clear Amazon rainforest for grazing. This is for grazing and feed crops, but mostly grazing. So this was 74,000, it's probably much greater than that now, about twice as much as last year, but last year was 40,000, and the year before that, 68,000 fires, wildfires. So again, we need to be reforesting, and this is what's happening as a direct result of cattle ranching for grazing to produce meat uh, globally. And as China, uh, the US and China are in the trade war right now, now it's um, being increased more to also feed uh, China's meat habit. Uh, a note of warning, uh, we do a lot of work, so we have a lot of research at OLFedWorld, awfw.org. We have a lot of research there, and we specifically focus on grazing so that people can understand that because it is promoted as an answer when it's actually more harmful. But it can also be used against us in a way that promotes factory farming. And this is being done at a global level. The impact of grazing, even though some communities promote it, at the global level, they understand that it's inefficient and that it's causing uh, the land use is, is problematic. And so that's why there's intensification. And so that argument can be used to promote factory farming. But then we have the other side of the coin where there's so much energy use in factory farming, it's still not the way to go. It's still not gonna solve the problems. So all the extra crops we've already discussed, there's processing, transportation, cleanup. So um, factory farming and energy use and carbon dioxide production is still uh, a problem no matter what. This is a really interesting piece of information. So cows are given a bad name 
uh, in terms of climate uh, unfriendliness, in terms of uh, so we feed crops, and I just talked about methane, but when they are factory farm, when they are fed feedlot, uh, soys and uh, corn, grains that are also fed to pigs and chickens, they're actually about the same in terms of uh, greenhouse gases. So then it is by weight. So that's just a really interesting point that most folks aren't really keen on or don't really know about, but it's about the same when they're not being grass fed. And back to the numbers. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the, um, the report that said it was 51%. So this is the World Watch Magazine report uh, that specifically countered the 2006 Livestock Long Shadow Report, and which said that the livestock sector is more uh, climate unfriendly and just environmentally friendly across the board than transportation. And so they did not expect that, that 2006 report that kicked off my uh, shifting and to focus on climate, and a lot of you will know the number that uh, livestock sector is more impactful than all transportation combined. They didn't mean for that to happen. They didn't think this was gonna be some kind of vegan rallying call. That report, again, is conservative. It was partly um, researched by the International Livestock Research Institute. They are all together with the livestock industry on these reports, and they still said that much about it. So this was done by uh, two climate scientists with uh, World Bank credentials. They weren't doing it as part of the World Bank, but that's uh, their credentials around it. And they, they talked about the ways in which it undercounted and misallocated and discounted and neglected factors altogether. And this is why their number is so much higher. So they focus on change. I, I don't really have time to get into what that means, uh, but it's, it's, it's a big factor in what's going on. They meant deforestation on massive scales. So they include Amazon deforestation in the UN report, but they leave out Argentina. The report doesn't even use their own uh, conversion ratios for factory farming. They emit all aquatic animals. And again, they use that 10 year I'm sorry, not 10 year, the 100 year time frame, which makes everything more conservative. So in this report, they use that 20 year time frame. And that's why these numbers are so much greater. If you're gonna use this number though, try to understand, and we have a whole page on our website that breaks down why this is different. So try to understand the difference if you're gonna use it, or if you speak to a range, you can say it's, uh, the UN put out a new report a little bit ago that says 14.5% basically just to get it down um, below the transportation sector. But whether it's 14.5% or 18% or 51%, remember that it's still competing with transportation and it's actually more and that's conservative. So we know it's much more, but depending on your audience, you may need to justify that. A lot of us here are here for the animals and we wanna focus on the animals. Uh, again, I already spoke about the ways in which climate impacts the animal issues, but this will be an influencer. So not, we, not everybody's gonna be impacted by the animal issue, but they will be impacted by climate issues. So target your message. I know it's difficult sometimes, and if you can't uh, do that because it's just not in your heart, uh, understand that it does have value or ponder it, that some people will not hear the animal message that will hear the climate message and that will help animals. It also helps all farmed animals as we show it, it impacts uh, dairy and then it also is something that goes against uh, the humane treatment because even if animals were to be treated better, they still have the climate impact and other environmental impact. Uh, and then of course there's all kinds of loopholes and misinformation about that, which is at humanefacts.org on my other slide. So no matter what, more than all transportation combined, Vegan is the best individual action that we can take. We know this. Um, and then aside from that, it's being an advocate. So the more other people you can influence to become vegan or reduce and take steps towards it, then that expands your own impact as well. And it doesn't compete. So even though we're talking about how much it is relative to the transportation sector, it doesn't compete. And so uh, we, it doesn't matter. It's a lot and we can do it all. Next up is the global trends. And this is the, the unsettling part. So we see here, when I started my work, I was working on these issues in grad school in the late 90s. And there was the uh, Livestock to 2020 report, which came out in 1999. This actually was uh, the, the fuel for me to, to switch gears and to start working on these issues. 
But what they were talking about is called the livestock revolution. And I'll, I'll get to that, but they were talking about the harm that this drastically increasing meat consumption and that it was gonna double between 2000 and 2050. That actually wasn't quite their number, but the UN took on this concept of the livestock revolution and said between 2000 and 2050, world meat consumption is going to double. And if you notice the numbers, so we have, this is in weight, but if you look at the actual numbers, it's more than double because a lot of that new production is gonna be chickens. And then of course it takes many more chickens to produce the same amount of meat. So the actual number of animals more than doubles, even though by weight it's about double based on their prediction. And I originally thought that there's no way we're gonna reach these numbers because of resource scarcity and water, energy, that we just wouldn't be reaching those numbers. Unfortunately, so far, I'm, I'm wrong on that. And you'll see the latest number uh, in the middle here is 70 billion in 2015. The latest numbers by Mercy for Animals have it now at 81 billion. And these are land animals, 81 billion uh, land animals per year. Um, and then still, still increasing. And the livestock revolution, the concept that I was referring to in that Livestock 2020 report, what they do is they blame this on growth. And this is much like the, the change in the other uh, article. But when you focus on growth, then you're gonna be focusing on others. You're not taking into consideration the consumption levels that are already there. So they're talking about the countries and populations that are increasing their per person meat consumption, their per capita meat consumption, and that this is a very large swath of the global population. It's actually about half the world's population as they're able to financially afford more, they eat more animal products. So you have a large population base eating more animal products, this is what's fueling the growth, and then you also have relatively high birth rates. So that's the combination that they call the livestock revolution. And one of the reasons that this is highly problematic is because it's not taking into account the current consumption. So the people who are writing these are, are researchers and analysts from high consuming countries like the US, like Europe. And so they're, it's blaming, it's putting the blame on the growth which they say all these problems, all these environmental problems, how are we gonna feed everybody, food security, on these lower income countries who are starting to eat more. This is just a chart to show the disparities. Again, the darker colors represent a higher amount of meat per person. And you'll see the US is very high, Europe is very high, Australia. What's not as high is India, China, and this is where a lot of increases are gonna come from because of population. This is where a lot of blame is being put even though we eat much more. And this is uh, another way of showing the disparities. Uh, I like to see this, if you, if you have this, if you can see up at the top, you'll see that Luxembourg is the top consumer. It's not true though. Uh, again, you have to know the numbers. So the reason Luxembourg has that top spot is because it's you know this little dot of a country between these bigger countries and there's a lot of Germans and French and Belgians coming in, um, driving in and eating food here but then going back to their own countries. And so what's counted in the statistics is just the consumption and then it's just divided by a small population. So that's why the numbers are high. Luxembourg has high out of control consumption rates for everything, cigarettes, chocolate, uh, soda and, and meat, but it's not true. You have to know the numbers. So you'll see actually France and Germany are around the middle level and that's where Luxembourg is. Don't you worry US, we're number one. We're number one, we are the world's largest meat consumers. So the leadership response, I, when I was reading this report in 1999 about the harm, they, they went into great detail, just like la, livestock's long shadow great detail about the harm of meat consumption. And what they wanna do is they wanna use technology to increase yields, to meet increasing demand, and then they wanna control population. And then they, there's various ways to uh, empower women and families and countries around population, and then there's very draconian methods that, uh, that can happen. So controlling population will decrease the demand and technology to increase the yield. These are the favorite uh, areas to focus, but they neglect 
consumption. They don't say reduce, even though they go through all this trouble mapping out the harms, they haven't said reduce meat consumption. Or if they say it, it's very light. Or in the case of the International Food Policy Research Institute that uh, authored the uh, Livestock to 2020 report, they said, it is unwise to think that the livestock revolution will somehow go away in response to moral suasion by well-meaning development partners. So that's, that's us. That's me. That's the work I was doing. You can't say reduce. Uh, the idea that it's demand-driven is what they are focusing on. They said it's demand-driven, as if demand is fixed. But it's not. We know this. It's a social construct, and it can be dealt with by uh, information campaigns, education campaigns, subsidy, redistributions, and such. So it needs to be addressed. Redu reducing consumption needs to be part of the equation. Uh, this is a book, Circles of Compassion. I have a chapter in there that spells out some of these issues, and Penaroba is in it, Salas Rio is in it, lots of great folks. Um, but it addresses this issue in particular, population and growth. It does need to be part of the equation. We do need to focus on it, but you have to be careful. Anybody who's talking about population, if they don't talk about consumption and the high levels of consumption or within countries that don't have high population rates, it's unbalanced. So it has to be, it has to be addressed together. And now the fun stuff, cultured meat. This is from a recent report. We, we, we should take a, in consideration that we don't know a lot about these predictions because it's so new. But this is one of their own reports. And I know this is controversial. I'm going to keep it pretty basic. So what they're saying here is that by 2040, they expect one third of global meat consumption to be handled by cultured meat. And then they also include what they call novel plant-based products, which would be Beyond Burger, Impossible Burger, these, these newer meat products or plant-based meat products that, that have a lot of similarity as opposed to conventional plant-based products that, that don't mimic it quite as well. The, some of the critics, I, I was trying to catch up on all the critics. I don't know all the critic remarks, but um, some of it was saying that between the, the combined, they're saying we're going to have more than half. We're going to have 60% of the global meat market by 2040. Uh, that's, it's a little difficult to tell because that they're including plant-based products where you normally wouldn't consider that as part of the meat demand. So I'm not quite sure where that takes place. But we'll just say one-third to be on the conservative side. And I know there's still use of animals. And so that's a problem. But... Uh, and then one of the critics that was saying that they are saying they'll have more than half uh, the global meat consumption, but really factory farming is still going to be increasing by 2040. And that's true if we still keep on this, but that's because it's increasing so greatly. So if a third of the increase of the total meat consumption, that would be 40 billion animals at this current rate. 40 billion animals. I don't know if those numbers are right. I hope they're right. I hope they're low. But if we were to take that out, that takes it down to 80 billion animals being consumed. Now, that's still 10 billion more. Well, it's, no, it's actually now. It's about the same. But so that's still more or the same as what we're consuming now. But it's not 40 billion more. So this is, this is the impact that cultured meat could have. It doesn't, it's not going to just get away. We're not just going to all of a sudden animal farming is going to disappear. But it could put significant dents into it. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I know it's controversial, but uh, anything, we, we just really don't have time to, to play with this uh, for climate reasons and, of course, for, for the animal reasons. And uh, I know there's some predictions out there that have us at a vegan world or uh, m much sooner than 2040 and that we need to be there. That would be great. Uh, so this is a, a backup plan if we, if we don't make it happen uh, sooner. Just uh, going ahead and closing up, we're talking about reframing meat, normalizing plant-based and hopefully plant-based, but normalizing a shift away from factory farm, conventional meat, and using animals for meat as much as we can. And so what counts as meat could be reframed, but also just a general idea of moving it from something that's celebrated to something that's shunned. And one of the important things about this is if we hit tipping points. 
So once we hit certain tipping points, like with smoking, uh, then it's, it's, it can make a bigger difference and we can have a much greater impact. So we, we've been slow, 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 but once we um, hit some of those tipping points, it'll happen much faster. And I just wanna leave off on some good news that it is getting better. A lot of you already know that we've been uh, fighting or encouraging or trying to work with the environmental groups. It's so clear that if you care about the environment, a plant-based diet is superior, just astronomically superior. But there's been resistance within the environmental movement. This focus on climate change is finally getting some movement. So these groups are not promoting veganism necessarily, but they're starting to move it up on the agenda. And 10 years ago, when I started A Well-Fed World, that was our purpose, is to help green diets, cool the planet, and working with the environmental groups, working with food justice groups to get plant-based diets or reduce global meat consumption, reduce consumption, anything, get diet change on the agenda, get higher on the agenda. Sometimes they'll list it, but it'll be way low. Uh, it'll be 10 or not 10, but we want it up there high. Even if they're not gonna say go vegan, getting it on the agenda, normalizing it, normalizing it in the way that recycling is normalized. And what does cultured meat have to do with activism? Just want to say we still need advocates. Clean meat, cultured meat, does not do away with advocacy. We need advocacy. We have to create the demand. We have to keep putting pressure on why it's better. And so there's a need for advocacy. And then the plant-based meats and the cultured meat, to the extent that people still want to eat the animal parts, it's there. It provides the supply. Uh, I don't know if you followed it, but the Impossible Whopper has stirred up all kinds of feelings on Facebook. You know, if, if people are gonna eat an Impossible Whopper and not eat a Whopper, that's great. You don't have to eat it, I'm not gonna eat it, but we wanna take out the, the Whopper, the beef Whopper, and the meat industries, if the meat industries are investing in clean meat, they're not investing in using, raising the animals for meat. And I know that animals are still being used to some degree within the cultured meat, but I just wanna say if I could provide a sample and all of you survive, that's worth it in the short run. It's not perfect, it's not ideal, but this is, we, we just don't have any options. We've been working on it, we can continue working on it, we can promote the ideal, but don't be upset, don't be distracted if we can by the, the cultured meat. A lot of these meat industries that are coming in and supporting it, don't be upset. Their money is going to support meat that is not coming from animals in the same way, at the same level, uh, mere fractions. So I, I hate to see us turning against something that could be so powerful, and I know we do have vegan advocates who are part of promoting cultured meat, but we also have many who are not, who are just on the ground doing the work or nationally not on the ground, working with corporations, whatever it is. But if we can get this as part of the equation, so we don't all have to agree, but multiple approaches are needed and they can complement each other. I would say uh, I have heard about sometimes the cultured meat folks will be dismissive of vegans and animal advocacy. And so hopefully that will change and they will become more nuanced to know that we are helping them. And then to the same thing, I would hope uh, for the vegan and animal communities that we wouldn't spend our time focusing on cultured meat and the ways in which it's imperfect and focus on our core issue of promoting plant-based diets, promoting respect for animals, trying to get them free from exploitation. And we can, we can focus on, on cultured meat and liberating animals from that uh, as, as time goes on. But for now, um, hopefully it's part of the equation. So follow your strength, follow your heart, and uh, don't be distracted. Don't let them take your energy focusing on some impossible burger when we have real work to do. And again, a well-fed world, awfw.org, thank you.